As Joshua said, we uh, welcome you to the Bartow History Museum's evening lecture this evening. Glad to have you join us and, and be here with us this evening. Uh, before we get started on our, our main event, let me give a, an update on a couple of uh, announcements that we've got coming up. First of all, I do want to say, uh, remind you that we are in graduation and Father's Day season. So remember our gift shop for your gift ideas for your graduate or, or fathers in your lives. On June 10th, we have a members only tea party that is quickly filling up. If you're a member of the museum and want to join us for that tea party, that is a Zoom tea party. I encourage you to uh, go online or on our website and check out information and get tickets for that event. Next month's evening lecture will be on June 24th at 7 p.m. That's a Thursday evening. Dr. Keith Abair will be here. He's a professor of history at Auburn University and his specialty is uh, the Civil War and he'll be here to talk about little known stories of the Civil War that took place here in Bartow County. And then finally in June, um, June 26th, we have an event called the White Glove Event where you as a, as a participant get to come in and put on the white cotton museum gloves and handle some artifacts with us. We're gonna be look, taking a look at uh, artifacts that don't ordinarily get seen um, on a regular basis that a lot of which will come out of storage for this event. And they all represent something to do with summer, summertime. So it's a great event to come out and learn more about the history of this area, but also get your hands on some, some cool artifacts. And, and we'll uh, talk about those things and give you some history and share some stories about all those items. We'll take a look at that evening. That's also a ticketed event, so I encourage you to, to get uh, your ticket soon, and you can find that information on our website. All right, well, without further ado, let me introduce our speaker this evening. Kathleen Amende is a professor of English and the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences at Alabama State University in Montgomery, Alabama. She's been teaching at ASU for 15 years in the Department of Languages and Literatures. Under her leadership, the college's research portfolio has grown, programs and support of faculty research have been started, and an institute dedicated to leadership mentoring is in the works. She received her BA from Bryn Mawr College, her MA from the University of New Orleans, and her PhD from Tulane University in New Orleans. Her specialties are in Southern and American literature, and she explores these specialties in her manuscript, Desire and the Divine, Feminine Identity in White Southern Women's Writing, published through Louisiana, Louisiana State University Press. She's also published numerous articles and book chapters on the civil rights movement, William Faulkner, Southern religion, and Southern sexuality. Her most recent work, including a second manuscript, has been exploring the post-apocalyptic landscape in Southern literature. Recently, she has also been active in immersive theater and her theatrical work, Fade, was produced by Sinking Ship Productions in New York City. She was also recently invited to show her work at the Stockholm Fringe Festival in Sweden. Dr. Amende is a fan of running with her dogs, playing poker, and watching movies, though she doesn't have enough time to do any of them as much as she'd like. Please join me in welcoming Kathleen Amende. Dr. Amende, it's all yours. Thank you. All right, uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and share my screen. Here. All right, is that, is that good? Can you see everything all right? Yeah, it looks great. great. Fantastic. Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you to everyone at the Bartow for having me, uh, especially Joshua for inviting me and Trey for that lovely introduction. And to those of you in the virtual audience for tuning in and logging on as, uh, as I speak, I know that the Gothic is an incredibly engaging and fascinating topic, so I'll try to do it justice and share with you the passion that I feel for it. Um, I want to start by talking a little bit about the concept of the Gothic itself, including its history. Of course, it has a very long and storied history, so I won't be able to cover everything. And I apologize in advance if I somehow miss your favorite Gothic production as I talk. Uh, but there's a lot to cover in a short amount of time. From there, we'll go on to talk about the Southern Gothic as a cultural phenomenon, and then look at whether or not the Gothic, with its ability to encapsulate so many different variations, is still a meaningful category in 2021. Uh, here's a hint, I definitely think it is. So let's begin then with a review of the Gothic. So here's a, a very short history lesson. The Goths were a nomadic Germanic people who fought against Roman rule in the late 300s and early 400s AD, helping to bring about the downfall of the Roman empire which had controlled much of Europe for centuries. The ascendancy of the Goths is said to have marked the beginning of the medieval period in Europe. 
afterwards, especially during the Renaissance period, the term Gothic came to be synonymous with all that was barbaric or uncivilized, especially in regard to medieval art and architecture. Flying buttresses and pointy arches, many critics of the time argued, represented the spirit of the Goth tribes that were responsible for destroying the Roman Empire's classical art. Thus, the label was not a positive one. Um, Patrick Kennedy, in his study of early Gothic literary works, uh, briefly expands on this connection between the architectural Gothic and the literary one. He writes that there are important, though not always consistent, connections between Gothic literature and Gothic architecture. Uh, Gothic structures with their abundant carvings and crevices and shadows can conjure an aura of mystery and darkness and often served as appropriate settings in Gothic literature for the mood conjured up there. So Gothic writers tended to cultivate those emotional effects in their works. And some of the authors even dabbled in architecture themselves. Uh, Horace Walpole, for example, also designed a whimsical castle-like Gothic residence called Strawberry Hill, a very non-Gothic name for a very Gothic place. So let's look at some of these early literary versions of the Gothic. If you notice Horace Walpole's novel, The Castle of Otranto uh, in 1765 was a good almost 30 years before the Gothic really took off with Anne Radcliffe's The Mysteries of Udolpho. Uh, the Gothic was a subcategory of romanticism, which was itself deemed by many contemporary critics an overblown reaction to the ideals of the 18th century enlightenment. And we can see here some of the more famous ones. Um, of course, Anne Radcliffe and Horace Walpole, uh, perhaps the, um, the most notorious of all of the Gothic novels, Matthew Lewis's The Monk, derided as, as pure obscenity at the time that it came out. Um, and of course, the most lauded of the Gothic novels, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. So it definitely had a wide range. Um, I would like to point out that when you look at this list of authors, uh, the majority of them are women. And, and this will become important as we continue to talk about this. So let's look at the romantic beliefs from which the Gothic bloomed. As most of you probably know, the 17th and 18th centuries were dominated by the age of enlightenment and the concept of reason. Enlightenment thinkers believed that truth could be discovered through logical thought and reason, not through faith or feelings or intuition. They believed that nature could be tamed through order and reason, and that thought should be prioritized over emotion, especially in the search for truth and understanding. Ultimately, they prioritized the evidence of the senses. Romanticism as a reaction to the enlightenment saw the concept of reason as far too cold. They valued emotions, imagination, individual experience, especially intuition. They believed in spontaneity, in action and emotion, and they saw the individual's relationship to nature as paramount and unable to be tamed. They moved away from the language of the educated man to the language of the common man, opening up literature for more people. They believed that strong passion and emotions should be valued over controlled language and wit. And they sought out the sublime. And, and here the sublime is that, that sense of greatness that can overwhelm rational thought. Uh, in 1757, Edmund Burke wrote an essay on the sublime, and in it he wrote that when danger or pain press us too nearly, they're incapable of giving any delight. They're simply terrible. But at a certain distance and with certain modifications, they may be, and they are, delightful as we every day experience. So the Gothic was similar to romanticism in that it valued this search for the sublime, but they didn't see this love and passion and nature as necessarily the method to get to the sublime. Instead, they saw horror 
and terror and mystery about the unknown as the most effective and interesting methods for getting there. So just as a kind of fun way to visually see the differences between the Enlightenment and the Gothic, we can take a look at their gardens. The ones on the left are ideal Enlightenment gardens, while on the right, we can see the ideal Romantic era gardens. Notice how the Enlightenment gardens are tamed, ordered, pleasing to the eye with symmetry and pathwork. The Romantic gardens, on the other hand, show nature beginning to encroach upon the works of humanity, threatening to crowd out man-made paths and to take over the scenery. These gardens move more towards Burke's idea of the sublime. So then what are the elements of the Gothic? What, what makes Gothic Gothic? Um, and these include um, taboo and transgression. And this can be anything from murder to incest to rape, uh, to perversion and insanity, to the use of magic and the occult, right? These are ideas that transgress the cultural status quo and the dominant ideologies of a culture. Um, mystery and fear, omens, curses, nightmares, foreshadowing and visions. The atmosphere and setting is carefully chosen to contribute to fear and uneasiness. So stories will take place in forests or mountain regions. Uh, there's usually ominous weather. If you remember your Frankenstein, every time Frankenstein's monster showed up, uh, it would thunder and lightning and the weather would be absolutely terrible. Um, there's a reason why uh, it was a dark and stormy night has sort of become a trope. Um, so graveyards, haunted houses, um, supernatural and paranormal activity, lots of ghosts and vampires and objects coming to life. Um, there's usually romance with a little R here. And this is, you know, there's a passionate love affair. It often leads to sorrow or tragedy. Um, oftentimes it is a forbidden romance. Uh, the villain is usually autocratic, usually male, usually in a position of authority. So a priest or a king or a nobleman. And the damsel is always in distress, usually trapped in some kind of domestic setting that has gone terribly wrong. Um, the heroes are flawed. Uh, often mistaken at first for the villain, they're essentially anti-heroes, uh, usually doomed or shrouded in some kind of sorrow or tragedy. Uh, another common trope of the Gothic is the use of the uncanny. Um, in German, the, the word is unheimlich, and it essentially means the unfamiliar familiar. So it's when we take something familiar and we turn it into the unfamiliar. So there's something that's off or not quite right. Uh, this might be dolls or automata or twins or doppelgangers. And I'm reminded here of the scene in The Shining with the, the two twin girls and uh, how frightening that was the first time I saw it. Um, and then finally, possibly most important, the Gothics believed in the fallen nature of man, that man was a fallen creature and that all Gothic work should reflect that. All right, so when the Gothic was being written, it was not viewed very favorably by the critics of the time. Um, some of the criticisms against the Gothic were that it appealed to the absolute worst in humanity, the ugly, the horrible, the obsessive. It contained too much sex, too much violence, too many unnatural acts. It was too common. It didn't do enough to heighten mankind or to enlighten them. Uh, there were too many shades of gray. You couldn't tell the hero from the villain often. And, and perhaps uh, most egregiously, the biggest insult was that it was considered women's literature. Even though it was titled inappropriate for women at the time, it was almost entirely produced and consumed by women. Um, and we can look here and see, and these are just two of hundreds of comments about the Gothic that came out when it was originally being written. And uh, this first one is from an article actually titled Terrorist Novel Writing, which is what they called the Gothic. They called them terrorist novels. Okay? Um, and this, this anonymous author writes, is the corporeal frame of the female sex so masculine and hearty 
that it must be softened down by the touch of dead bodies, clay cold hands and damp sweats? Can a young lady be taught nothing more necessary in life than to sleep in a dungeon with venomous reptiles, walk through a ward with assassins, and carry bloody daggers in their pockets instead of pin cushions? So clearly, like this insult of literature that they believed would damage a, a poor woman's psyche. Um, and then the second one is actually by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, himself a very famous poet. And, and he writes, for us to the devotees of the circulating libraries, I dare not compliment their pastime, or rather kill time with the name of reading. Call it rather a sort of beggarly daydreaming during which the mind of the dreamer furnishes for itself nothing but laziness and a little mawkish sensibility. So again, not seen very positively during the time. So then the question is, why? Why the Gothic? Why has it stuck around? If it was looked down upon so much by the critics of the time and was panned, then why is it stuck around? And I think we can look at this in two ways. My, my answer is that we have a, a twofold ability with the Gothic. We can view the individual using the Gothic through a psychological lens, and we can view society through a political lens. So in the Gothic, we compulsively return to the certain ideas, certain fixations and obsessions. And so psychoanalysis and other psychological theories sort of become the primary theories for understanding the Gothic. They help us to understand the, well, what they call neurotic disturbances of characters, but also of readers. Um, Freud himself saw the Gothic as a rich source of imagery. And I, I've listed here four of the works that he wrote that dealt with the Gothic and that pulled from the Gothic. And these are just four of many of his works, um, you know, dealing with things such as the or authoritative father figure or the abject individual, the Gothic or grieving state of the human mind. And in Beyond the Pleasure Principle, he specifically dealt with the death drive, this combination of love and death, and, and argued that we're driven by the things we fear as much as the things we love. Well, the Gothics would tell you that we are driven by the things we fear more than the things that we love. And when we look at society, just like we can look at individual anxieties, we can look at what our society's anxieties are. What is our society most worried about? How have our fears changed and how is that manifest in the Gothic stories that we partake of? Um, after the Second World War, the, the Cold War and the space race gave rise to this particular kind of, you know, alien horror in the 1940s and 1950s. Uh, the technological advancement in weaponry brought this fear of total nuclear destruction and apocalypse or invasion in the 70s through the 90s. The rise of feminism, gay liberation, African-American civil rights in the 1960s brought about a fear of the other that assaults the white heterogeneous and heteronormative narrative. And since the 90s, we've been looking at a fear of the loss of our world, climate change, ecological disasters, disease and infection. Um, so these are the things that if you look at the Gothic that is showing up on our television or showing up in the movie theaters or in our book choices, um, we're dealing a lot with uh, end of the world stories or zombie stories or vampire stories, things that help to look at our biggest fears as a society. All right, so contemporary critics now, what do they have to say? A lot of them believe that in the Gothic novel, we are able to present the unpresentable, that we are able to uh, find in them um, truths that are brought to us through fear, through understanding our fears. Um, Narsala Mambrol, the, the very last quote that I've included here, uh, argues what may perhaps be one of the most important arguments, and that is that the central concerns of classical Gothic are not that different from those of the contemporary, the dynamics of family, the limits of rationality and passion, 
the definition of statehood and citizenship, and the cultural effects of technology. The Gothic has always been a barometer of the anxieties plaguing a certain culture at a particular moment in history. Speaking of a particular moment in history, um, amusingly, in March of this year, so not very long ago, the BBC, as part of a review of books, published this article, Why We Are Living in Gothic Times. Um, in it, Hepzibah Anderson makes the argument that there has been, really since the start of the 21st century, an upsurge in Gothic productions, uh, both novelistic and filmic. And with 9-11, the global financial crisis, fears of climate apocalypse, COVID lockdowns, and increasing fears attached to political ideologies all over the spectrum, the world seems to have settled into a Gothic phase of existence. Um, like many other critics, however, Anderson runs into a problem of labels. I mean, I've just spent the past 10 slides explaining to you what the Gothic is. Unfortunately, it's a lot more and a lot more complicated than what I've been able to share. Um, novelist Sarah Perry in 2018 in the Paris Review wrote that the Gothic is rather a sensation like hunger or desire. And like hunger or desire, you may be hard pressed to describe it, but you'll know it when you feel it. And she's not necessarily wrong. After all, even if we haven't studied the Gothic extensively, we all seem to understand culturally what we mean by the Gothic. Right? And we can see this especially well when we turn our gaze towards the various regional and cultural genres that have sprung out of classical Gothic. Um, so some of these other forms of the Gothic, uh, the 19th century Imperial Gothic, which were novels of British imperialism, which look at the non-Western as an other um, and as a site of anxiety. The female Gothic, and again, this definition is contested as sometimes being not complicated enough um, and this being too limiting a definition, uh, but it is the most common definition used. And this is novels penned by women that examine a woman trapped in a domestic situation that is or has become unsafe. Um, the American Gothic, and now we're starting to kind of narrow down into what, what we want to see is that it's very American specific and has anxiety specific to America. And over time, this has been the wilderness, the Puritan legacy, slavery, uh, the unknown frontier, racial differences, national and personal identity. Um, American Gothic artists explore cracks in US social and political foundations to show the dangers of individualism or the disfiguring effects of regional provincialism or the terrifying oppression of women and minorities. We look at the human cost of social problems in the Gothic. And then the Southern Gothic is kind of a subgenre of the American Gothic and deals specifically with the cultural and social issues of the particular regions. Like some of the more well-known um, include, you know, William Faulkner, Flannery O'Connor, Eudora Welty, Tennessee Williams, Toni Morrison, Zora Neale Hurston. And then there is also um, African-American Gothic, which is kind of also a subgenre of American and it's seen frequently as part of Southern, um, but I would argue that it is, while it is definitely inextricably linked, it is not the same thing as Southern Gothic. And this deals specifically with the anxieties of the black population in America, um, often reversing the anxieties that are seen in the American or Imperial Gothic tropes. Right? And this goes back all the way to Harriet Jacobs, um, and also you know, people like Octavia Butler, Toni Morrison, and Tanana Reed do um, are also doing work or have done work in these areas. So there are other regional Gothic categories as well. Things like Midwest Gothic, Southwest Gothic, even California Gothic. Uh, it's even gotten to the point where the concept of regional Gothic has become a pretty popular meme on the internet. And, uh, and I pulled up here uh, the Georgia Gothic because I thought we might get a little bit of a kick out of this one. Um, and if we look at these statements, all of them are an attempt to uh, uh, instill in you a sense of Gothic foreboding. Um, this first one, which will sound familiar to some of you, it is fall, the time has come to choose red and black or yellow and black. There are no other colors. 
Whichever one you choose, you will be followed by the sounds of invisible hordes buzzing or barking. You cannot abstain. There is a wrong choice. No one will tell you what the wrong choice is. You used to know some people who made the wrong choice once. Their families miss them very much. Or my favorite, it is rush hour on 85. You have just passed an exit. The next one is in a mile. You are in the wrong lane. No matter which lane you are in, it will be the wrong one. You are used to failure. It has been rush hour for as long as you can remember. The next exit is in a mile. You remember your grandparents saying the same when it was their turn in the front seat. So you have this link to the past and this overwhelming sense of failure and this overwhelming sense of being overwhelmed. Um, but, you know, that's not all. If you do a search for the Georgia Gothic and you decide to go down that rabbit hole on the internet, you can find dozens of Georgia Gothic, downtown Atlanta Gothic, northern Georgia Gothic, suburban Georgia Gothic, middle Georgia Gothic, and the southern Georgia Gothic four parts. Right? It has even gotten to the point now where there is a meme about the meme, the regional Gothic Gothic. You read the memes of every place you've ever been. You begin to realize that you're reading the memes of places you haven't been, though you have an innate sense that you've been there before. You don't remember when this meme started. You don't remember how this meme started. You don't remember if this meme started. This meme has been around for as long as you can remember. So just something a little funny, but what does this all mean? Well, it means that the Gothic has become a site of converging and shifting definitions. It means that the very concept of Gothic has become elastic and can expand to incorporate quite a bit. So let's look at the Southern Gothic to see the ways in which the Southern Gothic does or maybe doesn't do something similar. Um, the Southern Gothic, according to the Oxford Research Encyclopedia, is, and you know, this is the, the boring dictionary definition, it's a mode or genre prevalent in literature from the early 19th century to this day. Characteristics include the presence of irrational, horrific, and transgressive thoughts, desires and impulses, grotesque characters, dark humor, and an overall angst-ridden sense of alienation. All right? When most of us think of the Southern Gothic, we think of the authors we read in high school and then maybe in college, some of the ones I mentioned earlier, Edgar Allan Poe, William Faulkner, Flannery O'Connor, Tennessee Williams, just to name a few. Uh, the Southern Gothic was prevalent in the early to mid 20th century and was often used to subvert and question Southern myth making. Faulkner, O'Connor, and Walker Percy, for example, used the Gothic to question old Southern ideals of race, gender, class, and religion. Tennessee Williams used it to poke holes in our ideals of gender, class, and sexuality. And writers like Alice Walker and Zora Neale Hurston used it to undermine tired tropes about all of the above, but especially race and gender. Just as early Gothic writers used the form to criticize the moral blindness of their era, Southern Gothic writers wanted to deal with what they saw as blindness, often purposeful blindness in their home regions. So what are the elements of the Southern Gothic that make it the same or different? Uh, crumbling house castles are replaced by crumbling plantations. Uh, damsels in distress are replaced by endangered Southern bells. Villains are often plantation owners. Uh, ghosts are often the ghosts of former slaves. Uh, voodoo is as prevalent as vampires. The taboo and transgressive also now includes miscegenation along with incest and other deviant forms of sexuality. The violence is often racial in nature. Um, Anti-heroes are often reformed convicts or runaway criminals. The settings are small towns, often run down. Uh, churches, usually with some kind of unusual feature, such as speaking in tongues or handling snakes. Um, and some of the unique features of the Southern Gothic include uh, freakishness or what Flannery O'Connor called the grotesque. Uh, these are the outsiders who are set apart from the cultural pattern and usually they're strange or bizarre. They have 
broken bodies or minds or souls who symbolize problems created by that cultural pattern. Um, and there is almost always an intense sense of place to the Southern Gothic. Um, some of the most common themes include buried secrets, uh, grotesque history, secrets related to taboo relationships, um, racial anxieties, so fear of the racial other or secrets related to race. Um, they are usually involving corrupted domestic spaces and this is very similar to classical Gothic. Um, there are conflicts between the past and the present, especially between sort of the idea of the old South and the idea of the new South. This was, uh, this was a very common theme that uh, Faulkner kept coming back to. Uh, you can especially see this in stories like A Rose for Emily. Um, the supernatural, not there as much. Um, you're de you definitely have some, especially recently, supernatural Southern Gothic. Um, but in large part, the Southern Gothic deals with other people. The, the villains are not ghosts. They're not demons, um, you know, sometimes, but more often than not, they are other people. So what did and what does the Southern Gothic provide? Um, author Christine Newland tells us that the Southern Gothic, with its sense of haunted rural America, and its awareness of the tainted history of things like white supremacy is a genre that has a lot to be said for it as a critical tool. Uh, destroying any moonlight and magnolia's romanticism inherent in the genre of Southern literary and cultural productions. According to her, it contains kind of a borderline nihilism that feels suited to our era even now. In part, many critics have argued, this is because of the way that the South has long been seen as America's other. If the Gothic as a genre often investigates the uncanny other, then it makes sense that the South, itself a national other, is a ripe setting for the investigation of identity and moral and ethical questionings. Um, and we have to look at, when we're looking at this, um, also, oh, I, sorry, let me pause for a moment. I, I have to share my favorite quote here, and that's, uh, Flannery O'Connor, anything that comes out of the South is going to be called grotesque by the Northern reader, unless it is grotesque, in which case it's going to be called realistic. I thought you might get a kick out of that. Um, so we, we have to look at, when we're looking at the South, we have to look at African-American or Black Gothic. Um, they have much in common, and even if they're not the same or subcategories of one another, um, because they are so linked, it is important that we look at this as well. Um, and uh, Masha Wester in her book, African-American Gothic Screams from the Shadowed Places, uh, writes that there are far more African-American writers of Gothic fiction than the critics typically recognize. Um, these writers tend to um, change the genre. Rather than mimicking traditional Gothic conventions, they will appropriate and revise those tropes in order to speak back to the original Gothic uh, in order to say, you know, it, it is not the, uh, the, the black demon or the black zombie that is the, the real threat. Um, and so they will not just reverse, but also kind of shine a light onto um, America's idea of the Gothic. Um, these authors also destabilize and defy singular projections of their own identity um, because those identities, she argues, um, can be used as um, used in the production of white patriarchal dominance. Okay. All right. Um, so ultimately, what all of this leads to is a network of Gothic productions that question and subvert what we think of as the dominant or meta narrative of American life. The Gothic looks at binaries and dualities such as black and white, rich and poor, high and low, straight and gay, and it questions the nature of those dualities. It especially questions the duality of self and other. The other, in fact, is one of the primary figures of Gothic production. Um, because film is such a visual media, uh, I like to use these film stills and film clips to show 
what I'm talking about. Um, here we can see actual images used to represent the, the, the other, the things that we don't understand or that we feel are alien or foreign to us. And these are classic Gothic films, right? These are not contemporary. Uh, and we can see vampires and monsters and monstrous humans and zombies and wolfmen and sexual deviants. Uh, these were all used to tell the story of the other, which really is a story of what we most fear about ourselves and our society. So um, just really quickly, I would like for us to take a look at um, the Gothic as depicted in film. Um, the British Film Institute released as part of its in-depth study of the Gothic film, a top 10 list of books and critical materials and a number of films. Uh, this is the shortened version of their four minute review clip that they sent out. This is about a minute and a half. Um, You can notice all the elements that that we have already talked about in here. Now, it is time to keep your appointment with the wicker man. And they, they call it Gothic, the dark heart of film. Um, but I think you could argue that Gothic is the, the dark heart of society as well. Uh, if that didn't sound pretentious enough for you, I'm, I'm not sure I can get much more. Um, all right, so here are, in comparison, um, some of the films we think of as traditional Southern Gothic films. Um, notice Betty Davis and Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte and Jezebel, plus classics from Tennessee Williams, uh, James Dickey. Uh, Robert Mitchum in Night of the Hunter is especially prominent in our images of Southern Gothic film. It, it might be the classic Southern Gothic film if we're, if we're talking about the classic Southern Gothic. Um, and then some more contemporary ones here. Um, we have The Beguiled. We have a lot of television. True Detective Season 1, American Horror Story Coven, um, Rectify, Devil All the Time, uh, all of these, these television shows, and then films like Big Fish or Mud or Daughters of the Dust or The Beguiled. Um, but one thing you notice is that with two exceptions, none of these are dealing with the supernatural. Um, traditional Gothic uses monsters and uses vampires as a way to distance the people or the other that they are worried about. Whereas the South removes that layer of distance and has always just skipped over the metaphor to look the Gothic in the face. And so in the South, perhaps more than anywhere else, the Southern can be used with less, essentially with less nuance that can get lost on the audience. Um, it is more obvious. It is more useful as a tool. So I sat down to put together a reel for you of the Southern Gothic films that's similar to the one uh, that the BFI released for Classic Gothic. And I found one that had been created by uh, YouTuber Titian Pugh. And uh, it's done so well that I saw no point in reinventing the wheel. Um, so please enjoy for a few moments this video. And notice, um, I've, I've listed some of the... Um, these Southern and African-American Gothics is reflected in film, um, notice them and notice the lack of the supernatural. You're not from the South. You won't understand. Hold my hand, 
Oh, baby, it's a long way down to the bottom of the river. Hold my hand. Oh, baby, it's a long way down, a long way down. Oh, if you get none, Jack's gonna call in the morning, baby. And check the cupboard for your daddy's gun. Red sun rises like an early morning. The Lord's gonna come for your firstborn son. Says on fire and his heart is burning. So go to the river where the water runs. Wash him deep where the tides are turning. Mm-hmm. You fall. Live you fall. Hold my hand. Ooh, baby, it's a long way down to the tide. Um, so one of the things that's interesting about, uh, about the Southern Gothic here is that the past in these films, in these stories does not return to cause trauma. It's, it's never left. I mean, and this is very reminiscent of William Faulkner saying the past isn't dead. It's not even the past. Um, you know, if we want to talk about, nature for example the nature nature is dangerous only if humans have spoiled it and we see here uh, a little uh, reference to annihilation which is based on jeff vandermeer's book series in which the entire area of florida and presumably the rest of the world is eventually sort of taken over by a a corrupt nature um, that is created that way when, when humans destroy it all right. Um, sorry, don't mean to start that again. Um, some of the other films, a lot of recent Gothic films have been used to critique um, and look at our society. These are some of the more contemporary films that have made use of uh, both the Southern Gothic and, and non-Southern Gothic here. I mean, you're going to see uh, Eve's Bayou in 97 by Casey Lemons, all the way up to Candyman by Nia DaCosta in supposedly in 2021, but uh, because of COVID, who really knows? Um, Get Out and Us by Jordan Peele are in here. Um, The Love Witch by Anna Biller, which is comedic, but is a scathing Gothic look at gender roles. Um, The Witch by Robert Eggers, which is a really fantastic feminist look at colonial era Gothic and the fear of wilderness. Um, Crimson Peak, which does a really great thing where it takes the Gothic and it sets it in America. And then the main character leaves America and goes to Europe. And it, it contrasts American Gothic with British Gothic. And, and it's a lot of fun. So there are um, still all of these Gothic films and Gothic stories that are being told even now. Um, so critics often suggest that the Gothic becomes more popular during moments of cultural crisis and moments of fear within a nation. And if this is true, and I believe it is, we're currently in such a moment and it shouldn't really surprise anyone. Somewhere between fears of terrorism, ecological annihilation, racial violence, fears of turmoil, fascism and authority, and the realities of COVID-19, we do seem to be living in Gothic times. Um, So let's sum up what we've talked about here. The Gothic has been seen negatively by some critics because ultimately the status quo was preserved in many of the classic Gothic uh, stories. It, they're heteronormative. They preserve a white patriarchy. Uh, the rule of white males is ultimately not questioned. Um, the contemporary Gothic, however, 
turns that around. It threatens the white patriarchy. Often the survivors are non-white or women or both, and the patriarchy is often permanently threatened. Um, it can be progressive. This is a world where changes can be made and where racial, ethnic, sexual minorities are not simply caricatures. Um, it can address contemporary political issues through a metaphorical and non-metaphorical situations, uh, things like infection and disease and disaster, et cetera. Um, Southern and African-American Gothic address the needs of Southerners who are often neglected by the Magnolian Moonlight novels and films that are set in the South. Um, it also addresses specifically Southern cultures with all of the Southern trauma that exists uh, in the South. And it looks at the ways in which that Southern past um, still lingers and haunts the contemporary South. So do we still need the Southern Gothic? Uh, yeah, because it speaks the unspeakable. It gives non-dominant voices a space in which to speak outside the constraints of realism or reality, which often doesn't allow for those voices to speak. It allows for a critique of fascist authoritarian spaces and of society at large. It allows us to document and make sense of the social forces that constrain and marginalize the lives of national, racial, sexual, gender minorities and creates a narrative through line that lets us see the ways in which the past leads to an intersex with the present, okay? Now, I wanna conclude, not yet, I wanna conclude with a few comments that are gonna complicate everything I just told you, right? The Southern Gothic is a complex idea for many reasons. Even just the phrase Southern Gothic is troublesome. After all, what precisely do we mean by the South? Are we referring specifically to a series of states? If so, which ones? Uh, even the most devoted Southernists often debate whether or not places like Missouri, Texas, Southern Florida, Northern Maryland, or even Southern Ohio ought to be considered part of the South. Whether we're trying to use geographical boundaries, such as state lines or the Mason-Dixon line, or whether we're trying to use cultural milestones, such as whether a state was a slave state or a free state, it's not always clear what we mean by Southern. So in looking at Southern Gothic, we have to take it with a grain of salt. And we have to understand that while it often incorporates traditions associated with the concept of the South, it's not always clearly definable by geography. There are, after all, novels and films that firmly fall within the tradition of the Southern Gothic, but take place in locations outside of commonly identified Southern states. The last 10 to 15 years have also seen a movement in Southernist circles to look at a more global understanding of the South that can include the history and culture of places that are technically outside of the South, uh, such as uh, the Caribbean and Latin American countries and then globalization, globalization within the South itself. And, and then there's the concept of the Gothic. Um, in their introduction to the Palgrave Handbook of Southern Gothic, uh, Susan Street and Charles Crow explain that the concepts of Southern and Gothic are often too monolithic and not inclusive enough. Uh, it would be better, they explain, to critically look at crossroads and intersections between region and nation and hemisphere. And while I certainly agree with these sentiments, and I find a great deal of value in questioning what exactly we mean by both the South and the Gothic, I do think that there's also a great deal of value in looking at the Gothic as we have today in order to understand the ways in which artists and filmmakers and authors and, and other producers of cultural artifacts are addressing concerns relevant to the South. If our tendency as a nation is to exclude and silence the narratives that counter the dominant one, then the Gothic becomes even more important because it is a place where the voice of the counter narratives can be heard. If the Gothic questions logic and reason, then it also questions neoliberalism and fascism. If the Southern Gothic subverts the tropes of the old South to reveal dark truths of our past, then we need it to help us find the answers for how to overcome that past as well. And I'd like to wrap up with uh, a quote from author Sarah Hillary. And Hillary says, as humans, we're hardwired to be curious and there are never enough answers in the real world, especially at times like these. So we look into the dark corners in the hope of surviving the scare, but also in the hope of finding the answers. And thus reading or watching Gothic fiction is a safe and far more satisfying
form of doom scrolling. Well, thank you for that, uh, Dr. Mindy. We appreciate that. Very interesting um, look at Gothic literature. Uh, I will open it up for questions now. If anyone out there has a question for Dr. Mindy. Well, I guess I can start it off. I actually have like a couple um, things to say. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, it was an excellent lecture. I really enjoyed it. Um, but I just wanted to say that this lecture would have been super helpful a couple of years ago. Um, I wrote an article in college for one of my journalism classes called Southern Spirituals, where I talked about this kind of weird dichotomy that we have between Gothic culture and the fact that we're like in the Bible Belt. And there's always this bit of a clash between, you know, the ideas of like Southern conservatism and, and you know, religion and the Southern Gothic that we have, especially in cities like Savannah, which I lived near when I was in college. Um, but also I wanted to ask, so um, I saw, I think, I think a little clip in that first one, uh, first video mm -hmm. you showed us, I think I saw a little clip of, of, of Twilight in there and I just yes. wanted to get your opinion mm -hmm. on this. Um, so it's kind of become a, a trend on TikTok recently. Um, where especially during COVID-19 and the lockdown, a lot of people my age, 22, 23, that were really into the Twilight books in middle school kind of reverted back to that mm -hmm. and, and went back to that. And they were like, this is like my comfort, you know, movie mm -hmm. series or whatever. Um, and I was just, I wanted to get your opinion on that, especially since it's kind of come out recently that you're talking about how this generation with like 9-11 and all the things like that, like we've kind of, really delved into the Gothic. Um, and it's kind of recently come out that the reason that the Twilight series was written, it was like 9-11 happened and then the band My Chemical Romance was formed and that inspired um, Stephanie Meyer to write Twilight. And so I wanted to get your opinion on all of these people kind of reverting back to like what they were doing in middle school to kind of cope with this worldwide trauma that we've had. And it seems to be rather Gothic in nature. Well, I, I think that, I mean, and there's a lot of questions kind of tied up in, in what you yeah. just said. And um, I think part of it is that when we are in a state of, of flux or when we are in a state where we're not sure what to do, um, a lot of times we will revert to the familiar. And so going back to something like um, the books that you read in middle school or the things that you found comfort in at the time um, makes a lot of sense. Uh, Furthermore, I think it's really interesting that um, one of the things that's happening with, with vampires especially is that they are becoming less and less of um, the other and more and more sort of the sort of protagonists of their own stories. And so what's really interesting there is that um, people who have often been considered the other or the outcast are finding a lot of pleasure in these stories about um, people who have traditionally been seen as monsters uh, now being seen as these kind of characters you want to get to know. And they're dangerous because danger is exciting and sexy and, and the Gothic is exciting and sexy. Um, but they're also more human a lot of times than, than the humans that we interact with. So I definitely, you know, especially right, you know, we're all in lockdown, you know, all of us are, are eager for that kind of human touch and vampires in particular are all about touch. So I definitely see a, a lot of things going on in that reversion. Thank you. That's very enlightening. <laughs> Go ahead, Amy. Hi. Uh, first of all, terrific lecture. I really enjoyed this and it gave me all these thoughts, which uh, I won't dominate the discussion. Um, but uh, one thing that came out at the beginning with your discussion of the Gothic architecture, especially uh, which happened in France and uh, to some extent in, uh, in England, but um, and, and Germany as well. But uh, the idea when I was when I was much younger, um, one of the classes I took in school was uh, about Christian architecture. And 
started with the house church and going on to the order of St. Benedict and so forth. But with the Gothic, especially with the Gothic cathedral, um, we were taught that the emphasis was on three aesthetic points, light, height, and harmony. Yes. Now, this is very interesting because, of course, all the flying buttresses were engineered to hold up the roof so that there could be gigantic windows to let in sunlight and the roof wouldn't collapse. Um, I'm just curious as to whether you came across this, um, this idea of light, height, and harmony in your exploration of Gothic architecture and also what kind of thoughts that brings in, as in, you know, you, you have this ornateness uh, that is suddenly made possible by a new engineering uh, process, mm -hmm. bring in sunlight, but then it also involves this almost decadent ornateness, whereas the Roman architecture or the Norman architecture in England was uh, fortress-like, mm -hmm. very much based on the Roman arch and, you know, the groin vaulting and so forth. I'm just curious as to what you brought in from that uh, in, your, in your thoughts about the aesthetic of the Gothic. So one of the things that comes up a lot when you, when you do research into the Gothic, um, a, a lot of the stuff dealing with the architecture is skimmed over uh, because usually, you know, they're, they're, they want to jump to the literature and they want to talk about the literature. But mm -hmm. one of the things that um, was really interesting to me is part of the reason for the height in the Gothic architecture was to get closer to God. And this was um, considered by some as, as blasphemy, right? Trying to, to reach way to the heights of the divine. And so in, in some ways, that was part of what was considered uncivilized and barbaric was how dare they try to do this. Um, and all of that light coming in also is responsible for shadow. So you can have these great windows and you can have all this light, but it's also going to create these pockets of shadow where things are going on that you can't, you can't be certain. You can't see. The bigger, the more ornate it is, the less you're actually able to tell what's going on. So even though, you know, the, the medievalists, the Goths would have said, these are amazing things. These are honor to God. Um, it, it was also kind of frightening. Yeah. Love it. Thank you. I, I also grew up, uh, right next to the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. So this was kind of my playground. And I can attest to the, uh, the complications of the light and shadow. Thank you. So, Kathy, I'm going to jump in real quick. I, I started by, like, making a little note, and I ended up filling up half a dozen little <laughs> notepads. So obviously I'm not going to ask them all. But um, one of the things that I, I thought about when you were talking about the lack of the supernatural in Southern Gothic mm -hmm. um, is, you know, I think about wise blood. I think about, you know, my mother's a fish. Do you think the, the Gothic, Southern Gothic replaced the supernatural with the absurd to get that stuck? I, I think so. Um, I think that it's, and not just the absurd, but also the grotesque, right? That um, when we talk about the grotesque, the, the image of the grotesque person um, is supposed to be representative of not like a grotesque body, not a monster, but of the thing that it is symbolic of. And the things that it is symbolic of, um, especially for Faulkner, were absurd. I mean, you know, I've already been saying my mother is a fish is almost logical compared to some of the absurdities that happened in that book. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, definitely, I think that one way to bring attention to uh, the actual absurdities is through those moments. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I had a quick question. Sure. Um, so Kathy, you talk about how Southern Gothic kind of gives a voice to the, those that don't have voices. Um, is there like any podcast or maybe even any like book or, or uh, anything coming out now because of the things that happened last summer? Do you, do you foresee something coming out like that? Um, 
I am not certain. Um, I, I don't follow podcasts as, as much as I should. I know that um, when we're talking about Southern Gothic podcasts, uh, S-Town is, is a, a major contender there, um, as is uh, the old gods of Appalachia. Um, but in terms of looking at um, specifically COVID and the things that have happened and the, the racial trauma that the country has been undergoing over the last year, um, I, what I tend to see happen is that those things will explode in terms of cultural productions about a year to a year and a half after they're over um, or, or after they started um, because sometimes there are things that continue. Um, so I would not be surprised to see that, that happening um, more and more frequently if it hasn't already started happening. Um, and, and I know, um, you know, one, one of the things I was looking at today was um, some shows that are, are being created for television that are being set like during now, during COVID, you know, where the actors are wearing masks in character um, as, as they're portraying their characters and dealing with the repercussions of, of the situations um, in America as they are. Uh, interestingly, uh, Interview with a Vampire is being remade and it is being made with, um, for those of you who read it, the uh, the journalist who in the first movie was played by Christian Slater and in the book is a very young drug addicted character. He's being played by a 70 year old actor. And the, the basis of the story is it is now 50 years later and he has come back to interview him again. And it is set with, you know, it is set within COVID. So we're going to be dealing with vampires dealing with COVID. So I'm, I'm actually really interested to see how that, that is handled. That's amazing. I know, Lauren, you were talking about Twilight. Interview with Vampire was my teenage age, so that was fine. <laughs> well, I mean, it's this huge thing. Like, I mean, uh, seriously, I rewatched uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer not too long ago. Um, and I think some of my issues started when I chose Spike over Angel, you know. Um, <laughs> I feel like y'all, some of y'all can agree with that. Um, and so just to kind of see the, and it was coming back like this resurgence. And so people are obviously going back to like the things that they felt comfortable with in a time of, you know, turmoil, but it's definitely leaning more into it. And I never considered that it was leaning into Gothic because I really didn't consider or even think about Twilight as being a Gothic piece until just about 20 minutes ago when I saw it included <laughs> in that in that clip and I was like I guess it is yeah. gothic and I and like I didn't think about Heart of Darkness being gothic either I saw that um because I remember reading that in AP Lit and really getting into it. a lot of people don't like Heart of Darkness because it can be kind of hard to read I loved Heart of Darkness um and I wrote on my AP Lit exam when I was in high school a comparison between it and Frankenstein mm -hmm. and that's what got me a four on the AP Lit exam <laughs> I didn't realize that I was comparing two separate pieces of Gothic literature from different times. I didn't realize that I just was kind of paralleling the characters. And so to come back later after I've gone through college and had a little bit more training and like looking into stuff like that and listen to you give a whole lecture on this kind of stuff. I mean, it's just amazing. Um, really interesting stuff. Well, you, you apparently have the heart of a true Gothic then. <laughs> apparently, I didn't know. <laughs> I, I did not know, um, but I, it seems great. What book, like if you were going to recommend like a, a contemporary Gothic piece or anything, what book is your like go-to in the genre? Um, my, my contemporary go-to? Uh, the most recent Gothic novel that I read that just knocks it out of the park in terms of the Gothic is a book called, uh, by Sylvia Moreno called Mexican Gothic which hit the, you know, all the, the bestsellers and everything and, and is just, is amazing. And what you find out is that like, you know, the, the villains are, I mean, come on, capitalism is one of the villains in that book. So, I mean, it is, it is just really amazing. And, and that is what I recommend to somebody who maybe isn't as familiar with it or who maybe wants to see a, a more contemporary take on it. Uh, if we're talking about the past, uh, if we're going back, I mean, obviously Dracula is kind of the classic Gothic 
you know, novel, but I actually think it's kind of boring. Um, I think Frankenstein is a much more interesting novel uh, and easier to read. Um, so I definitely, um, also sort of contemporarily, Shadow of the Wind by Carlos Ruiz Zafon um, is a very, very Gothic story um, that, uh, that, that, that will make you cry, that will make you cry tears. <laughs> it's very, very good. Um, and it's probably my favorite novel. So I think that's, that would also be where I'd have to go. All right. All right, any, anyone else? I'm back. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I'm just thinking about, um, first, first of all, I've just got a couple of things tangled together now thinking about um, Sam Taylor Fuller-ish funny enough, proto-goth extraordinaire, um, mm -hmm. having something to say about women, especially young women, reading lurid stories and thinking also when I was younger, Louisa May Alcott deprecatingly talking about sensation stories, which she wrote, mm -hmm. contained, you know, sex and horror. Um, and my recent reread during COVID of uh, The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde, which is highly aesthetic, lurid, and very queer. Now, when we get into queer gothic, of course, we're going to Tennessee Williams immediately. Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea of the perversion of relationships that goes in with gothic. Um, now, I'm curious, I mean, do you, do you see something with that, with that similar uh, crisis coming into women, especially, um, actually mothers, um, not just young women, reading and listening to and watching stories of murder, serial murder in particular, and the notion of the obsession and the aesthetic uh, mm -hmm. combined with murder. Yes, I just binged watched Hannibal, thank you. But, um, <laughs> but, but yes, just, just that sort of merging of all of the threats into one thing that especially women are being drawn towards and especially queer people are being drawn towards. You know, there is, I am sure that there are already studies that have been done on sort of the fascination with true crime and, and all of this, you know, these murder stories and, um, you know, these tw networks that run true crime 24 hours and that appeal so strongly to, uh, um, to, to the, not to the, the white male patriarchy of our country, right? That we are seeing a lot of um, interest in those by um, minorities and by women and by, you know, sexual minorities and gender minorities. And it's, it's really interesting. And I don't want to try to posit exactly what's going on there. Um, I think it is similar to what, what happens with the Gothic, um, with it being a place where um, you can indulge in something that is not safe, but in a safe way. Um, you know, fantasies of revenge, fantasies of getting even, um, all of these that are, are really just kind of normal parts of humanity, but being done in a, in a kind of safe way, um, that there is a kind of strength that people can get from that. Um, but I don't, I haven't done that research. So I don't want to, I don't want to delve too far into, into that particular phenomenon, but it is definitely connected and definitely really interesting. Well, Dr. Mende, I want to uh, thank you for being with us this evening. I think we've all learned something uh, from your presentation and, and um, gotten a lot out of it. As, as you can see from the questions we've, we've had for you this evening, uh, we really appreciate your time and time and, and knowledge here with us. Uh, folks, it's uh, after eight, so I will let you um, get on to your other evening activities. We appreciate you coming out this evening and joining us, and I hope to see you again uh, at one of our upcoming lectures and, and programs at the museum.